What was your first car? Wow. <laughs> um, my first car was a Volkswagen Squareback. What? That was my first car. What yeah. color was it? Uh, it was that sort of kind of beige color. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> beige color. Nice little surf, you know, uh, back in the days I used to. What year was it? Surf. Oh, my gosh. Um, it was in 1987. Okay. Yeah. Wow. 1987. Okay. Yeah. 1987. Yeah, I was in college. Back, yeah, Volkswagen Square Bank. So. On the nice. island. Actually, no, to tell you the truth, I, uh, I got my first car when I was in college. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, at Oregon State. So, ah, okay. Yeah, I'm a beaver. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I remember yeah. that from your book. Yeah. Um, so, hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins. This is the only one in the room, but I am never the only one in this room because, as usual, my producer, boyfriend, and co host, Scott Slaughter, who Aww. I call Hun, <laughs> you can call him Hun too, <laughs> okay. is here as well. Hi, Hun. Hi, honey. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. <laughs> so, oh, I'm um, feeling left out, so no, I had no, to no, throw no. that in there. Sorry. You're getting that fun laugh for sure. Yes. Okay. Right? He's such a honeypot. Absolutely. Um, Hun, do you happen to know the Canadian national anthem? Uh, the one like, oh, Canada. <laughs> Actually, that's all I know. Well, we are definitely going to need to learn the words because Canada loves us. Next yeah. to the UK, which I'm attributing completely to our friend Leah and her mm-hmm. whole family. We have more downloads and subscribers in Canada than any other country in the U.S. Wow, I'll try it again. Oh, Canada, our, our home, home and native, native land. You better sing, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I did that um, oh, last yeah, you, year. Actually, yeah. you could sing that you, for us. Oh, you Canada. Oh, my hey. God. <laughs> My whole man. Yeah, it's, it's no, a, no, no. It's keep a going. fun. It's a fun. Keep going. This no. is for our Canadian fans. Please. I was up there in uh, Winter <laughs> Winterpeg um, doing the anti-bullying program uh, for one of the schools up there for Morin, and then uh, their their local uh, hockey team, yeah. the Dragons, yeah. had me sing the uh, the Canadian national anthem. So just anthem. just give us a couple more bars. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to look up the words. I, I apologize, oh, Canada, but yes, yeah, our home and native land. Just sing that. Oh, Canada, my home and native land. <laughs> what is the other words? Canada. That's all I know. Yeah. Yeah. I got goosebumps. Ah, oh, thank yeah. you. No, yeah, but too. Canada, I do a lot of, well, we can talk about this yeah, yeah. later, but yeah. I do a lot of work for we. That's, we day. That is amazing. And so, Canada, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, that was, wow. Um, so... We would love for you guys in Canada, our Canadian listeners, to please join our new Facebook group and post your favorite episodes there. Right. Anyone who posts will get a shout out on the show. So please post away. And also, if you're one of the lucky super fans who brought who bought your only. Also, if you're one of our lucky super fans who bought your only one in the room T-shirts, hoodies or hun hats from our website. Hun hats. Post a picture of you and your gear on social media. Make sure you tag us and you'll be eligible for some free exclusive merchandise. That sounds good, honey. Not as good as Sarah sounded, yeah, but right. sounds good. Um, all right, I'm going to introduce our guest. Mm. Sarah Tuaalo um, is of Samoan ancestry, born in Honolulu, Hawaii. He grew up on a banana farm in... So help me out with this. Why Manalo? Why Manalo? Yes. And is the author of the memoir, Alone in the Trenches, My Life as a Gay Man in the NFL. After retiring from the NFL, Tualo came out as gay in 2002 on HBO's Real Sports and began a career of advocating for the LGBT community. He has worked with different sports organizations, including the NFL, the Gay and Lesbian Athletics Foundation to combat homophobia. He's helped reject a homophobic state marriage bill. Wow. So wait, you helped reject a homophobic state marriage bill by testifying before legislature and continues to speak at colleges and corporations about explicit and implicit homophobia. Tualo has been in front of the camera most of his life from NFL games and music videos to top television programs for his LGBT advocacy and music performances. He came on my radar when he was a contestant on the 20. 20- Season 13, season 13 of The Voice, which you just heard. And it's so amazing. Um, you were so great on that show. Oh, oh thank you so much. Um, and he currently serves as the executive chef at the Pilgrim House in Provincetown, where he also performs. Um, and lastly, he has twins, Mich- uh, Mitchell and Michelle. And were you going to just say something about your performance at the... 
um, Pilgrim House? Oh yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a great opportunity for me to sort of um, you know just to um, continue my art, I guess. And yes. so there is a uh, this year I brought out a character. Yes. Uh, you know, it, her name is Polly Lava. Yes. I'm doing drag. And I, it's the last closet because when I wrote the book, I opened up a bunch of closets and it was mm-hmm. the most hardest thing I ever did in my life. But um, having this character back in when I was like five or six years old, dressing up in my sister's you know, clothes and makeup, I used to get beat by my brothers and my cousins for doing that. So I put that, clo- you know, I put it in the closet and, and tuck it away. Yeah. Being in Provincetown, you can sort of kind of be whoever you want to be. And uh, I did a show last year. And then so this year I brought Polly Lava out. And so I have, you know, I redid the songs, uh, How Far I'll Go. Right. Um, and, you know, singing about McDonald's. And yes, so it was yes. just the most funnest thing I've ever done. Is funnest? I think that's a word. Right? Hey, I we're think, making yeah. it a word right exactly. here Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's um, that's my, you know, uh, Province Town. So if you're in Province Town next year, please come and check me out. And, yeah, come eat my food at the Pilgrim House, but also come and check out the show. It's a lot of fun. That is, it's so cool that you are the executive chef. And I know, right? And you, like, change and you come out as this amazing... You guys have to see this picture. We're going to have to try to put it somewhere because the picture of him as his character is... It's, it just makes you smile as yeah, soon as you look at it. thank you so it. much. It's wonderful. I said, yeah, tell people it's Moana's big sister. There you, you know, go. Her, <laughs> her fat sister and stuff that didn't get picked for the movie. So oh. I don't like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, I was going to just, I don't want to spend too much time on your childhood yeah. because we're going to talk more about what you're doing now cool. and and your experience in the NFL and all of that. But right. you were born... Um, in July 1968. Yes. Just like my honey. Whoa. Yes. Yes. 51. <laughs> 51. Oh. Rocking 51. 51. Exactly, right? And 51 and proud. Yes. You, know? you don't yeah. look you look young. Yeah. Oh, thank oh you God. so much. But yeah. I, and your spirit is oh, really young too. Yeah. So that's that's I think that's yeah. the most important thing. I think so. I think that's what keeps people young, is mm-hmm. their spirit and their, you know, their outlook on and life. Good face cream. Right. <laughs> honey. <laughs> Moisturize, moisturize, and more. A little Vaseline in your eyes. We won't tell all the secrets, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so you're the youngest of eight children? I am. I am the youngest and the the, the, the most handsomest. And the most <laughs> of course. Cutest and the of most. Course. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, so I, I what I heard in your book or what I read yeah. in your book was this kind of a dual childhood like part Mm. of it was like really magical where there are mangoes and bananas and you're in the fields and you love nature can you talk a little bit about that oh my gosh yes um you know there's two sides of the story i tell people i you know i didn't grow up my life wasn't like a moana story but Mm -hmm. um yeah it was beautiful grew up on a banana farm the outdoors going to the beach you know, my family, I grew up in a very poor family, but it was, you know, growing up in Hawaii, poor is a lot better than anywhere else, I right. think, in the world. And, you know, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old. So my mom did a fantastic job, you know, taking care of eight of us and making sure that we didn't feel like um, we were poor or we were lesser than anything. And mm-hmm. uh, But, you know, in Hawaii, there's the beaches, there's, the, you know, the produce, the, the mangoes, like you said, the papayas, yeah. the, the nature and everything else. That was, uh, it was incredible growing up in that environment. And what was the other side of your childhood um, there? The other side, um, growing up in a masculine culture and being um, gay. Yeah. That was the, and, you know, all the negativity things that you would hear and see, um, you know, um, of who you truly were. I think that was sort of, for me, it was the, the hardest part. And not only that, you know, I, I explained in, this, in the book, I'm an open book. You know, it was this almost, uh, I was a poster child for being molested. Right. And for me, being like five or six years old, I could never, I don't know, it was just one of those things when my kids were five and six, I couldn't imagine anyone doing anything like that. So, but yeah, it was, it was very hard. It was very dark and um, a lot of prayer and a lot of, you know, things that I need to do to survive, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I mean, the way you describe it in the book, yeah. specifically with your uncle, yeah, um, it's it's very sinister yeah. and very dark, and you were told to keep it an absolute secret. Well, yeah, and also, you know, when you're young, you don't know anything, like, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where if that's supposed to be right or not supposed to be wrong, mm-hmm. you know, and I think in the book, I really sort of kind of want to make sure people understand 
you know, what I went through and sort of kind of did a little bit more graphic than anything. But I just wanted people to understand that sometimes, you know, they make it like a big game and right. a fun thing to do. Yes. And then it's one of those things where you just you don't know if that's right or wrong because no one's telling you. And then when it hurts. That's when it, then the whole fear thing kicks in and then the whole controlling thing kicks in and him, you know, threatening uh, my life and threatening my fam my, my family's life. And yes. stuff. So, yeah. So as a little kid, I'm five, six, seven years old. How am I freaking no. supposed to like take that? Right. And so I guess when I was on Oprah, um, hey. she, you know, it was this one of those things being able to talk to her about it because she went through the same similar situation. Yes, she did. Yeah, and it sort of kind of opened my eyes because it's like you know what we my innocence was stolen from me, mm -hmm. like a lot of people. Yes. Innocence is stolen from them when they are that young and they're molested. Right. You know because you know it's it, and I always thought it was my fault. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I thought I, I did something. F to you know to provoke that you know for him to do that and in actuality no it wasn't it wasn't my fault and after sort of listening to her and also seeing i think she had a segment on it it mm -hmm. was one of those things yeah. where it sort of kind of opened my eyes and um and made me realize and stuff it wasn't my fault i was right. a victim of some you know um, if something was stolen from me yeah you know, so well and she had a she had an entire show where mm -hmm. um the entire audience was comprised of men who had been molested yeah Yes. And and then she had other people discussing it. So that was a yeah. really powerful, that was a really powerful show. And I'm just thinking that, you know, this is, that is enough to be damaging beyond repair. Yeah. But what you were also contending with was being, uh, is it Mahu? Is that the pronunciation? Yeah, Mahu. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Mahu, Fakalati, uh, Fafafine are the terms uh, in Polynesia that is, um, means gay, mm -hmm. faggot queer uh and so um having to deal also with that in such a masculine community that was right. very difficult but in one sense being in our culture being a fafa fine mm -hmm. is sort of like the american indian so being a fafa fine is it's okay as long as they know where you stand if you dress like a woman act like a woman some are even put in high positions as medicine people or anything like that right mm -hmm. so it was it was okay right but then when somebody like myself being masculine and a warrior that comes out, that's when there's a problem because now people are starting to question our masculinity and who we are as a culture. Right. right. So I think that's the whole deal. So I, um, but yeah, growing up and hearing all those things, those negative things, I remember um, on the playground when I was a little kid, friends of mine were beating up this other kid, throwing rocks at him and and spitting on him and, and calling him Fafa Fine and, you know, Mahu. And I sort of kind of wondered, what? What are you guys doing? Like, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I, he likes um, playing, he likes hanging out with the girls. He likes playing with his sisters, dolls. He likes boys. And so I thought to myself, well, I like doing all those things, you know? And so I think after seeing the hate, uh, that they had for him. We, I didn't even, we, I didn't understand the word at that point in time when you're young. I just saw how much, how that the hate that they showed this kid. That's the day I tell people that I put that child within me in the closet. Mm -hmm. The child we have within all of us, I put him in the closet and, um, and I never let it go because every single time I tried to let that child out, there was somebody who would say something negative about being homosexual and or anything like that. So I just I just pushed that kid further and further in the closet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I became an actor and then, you know, I had to be bigger and stronger and faster than anyone. So no one would throw rocks at me or spit on me or call me a mahu. Yeah. Right. So that's that whole masculinity thing sort of kind of kicked in, which is very sad in a way, because then you sort of kind of lose yourself for who you truly are, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, for me, it was very, um, hurt a lot. Yeah. yeah. You um, you said in the book that you used to watch the the Justice League on TV and yeah. that I, you identify with Wonder Woman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I love. I did too. <laughs> yeah, Wonder, I love Woman. Wonder Woman. But yeah. you also said that it was um, 
being gay in, sure. in your culture was like being a superhero. Yeah, exactly. Right? I, think it's, yeah. I think in any culture, right? Be, uh, no one knowing your true identity right. and who you truly are. Right. I think that's that's the thing. I, I, um, I think one of the biggest reasons why I love reading comic books and reading stuff like that, because I could sort of kind of cope a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a superhero. You know, I used to put tinfoil on my wrist and yes. tell my cousins to throw rocks at me and see if I could reflect it <laughs> <laughs> you know, or climb a tree and try to jump from you know limb to limb. So wow. anyway, it's just, yeah, I think it's, yeah. you know, I think a lot of the LGBTQ community can relate on that. They mm -hmm. can relate about, you know, it's hiding your true identity, Yeah, you know, to that time where somebody finds out. Right. Right. And then you live in fear of that time. And you live in fear at that time. Yeah. Right. And it's always, always like kind of thought about it. So why, you know, being a superhero, why would you, have to hide your identity, right? I mean, that's the, but then, you know what I'm saying? It's just, just one of those things where if you're a superhero and you're not, people love you, then why would you have to hide your identity? But again, it was one of those things that, you know, I right. felt comfortable with and something that I could like go to when I was a little kid and read. Yeah. Um, you know, especially growing up in a, you know, a religious family, that Pentecostal hallelujah well, church. That's what I wanted to ask you next because <laughs> You say yeah. that you um, yeah. you heard sermons against homosexuality yeah. growing up, and that yeah. you actually would go somewhere I forgot you some field and you would pray yeah. to have the curse removed. Yeah, can, can you tell me about that? Well, I think you know growing up in that whole Pentecostal assembly of God and hearing the propaganda of all the negativity things of homosexuality, but not just that about everything else. It was very hard, I think, on the little kid and walking. Yeah, I used to go into the banana fields and just drop on my knees and tell God, please take this curse away, you know, this abomination away. And um, mm. and he didn't. And I have to tell you, um, so going to church in Polynesian church is, uh, <laughs> we had to like, um, we had to memorize like 10 verses every time we went and you couldn't use the shortest one, Jesus wept, or you get slapped in the head. But I came across a verse and it sort of kind of helped me throughout my whole life and helped me realize and stuff that I'm not a mistake and I'm not a, you know. So it's, um, it was, uh, don't put your trust in the flesh because the flesh will fail you. But put your trust in God because he'll never fail you. And who is the flesh? pastor the people your parents your cousins everyone right so and that's what i did i started putting my trust in in god and um then i always tell people if you want to see a miracle you're looking at one because i should be six feet under yeah right but there's no one you know and i do um debates on homosexuality and 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 religion no one holds up the bible and says the book of destruction and the book of hate and the book of you know it's a book of love compassion mercy and grace you know, I mean, and when I go a lot of, you know, talk to a lot of college kids and they're like, well, it's, you know, it's such a negative. Well, have you read the Bible? Because if you haven't read it, I read it because you can interpret it any way you want. But no one re does a book report and just, you know, do a book report of what they heard on the radio or on television. Right. You got to read it. So right. just read it for yourself. Right. For me, you know, where to start? Well, start with Psalms. Psalms is a beautiful book. Right. Start there and start, you know, reading. And, you know, so I get a lot of backlash sometimes from the, the LGBTQ community and from people and stuff because of my my faith in God. I mean, I'm not perfect, though. I mean, no one is. Right. We all fall short of the glory of God. So. Um, so long story short. Yeah. And that's that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really I think you're right. You are a miracle. And how beautiful mm -hmm. that as a child you were able to to take this these things that were being said to you yeah. that you felt were against who you were authentically yeah. and being able to find something in that to latch on to. So I, I'm glad you brought up your family because sure. um, I know that you were really, you had, a, you had a very interesting relationship with your father and you loved him right. um, very deeply. And, and then he died suddenly right. and that was, that was horrible. And um, you were, you were really bereft yeah, after that. I was. Um, and then you were sent to live with your older brother. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I only, I'm skipping to this because it seemed to me this is where you found solace in football when you mm. were living with him. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah. Sort of. It was one of those things where I, um, 
I um yeah I went to go. It was also a nightmare as well. Right. No, like, <laughs> we won't talk about that. Well, but um, yeah. but it was uh, yeah I found sort of a, a different way because um, he was such a football fan and you know and so he wanted me to start playing football. So I started playing football and you know getting out there and you know it didn't really work out the first time and then until you I were, went you back. You were how old then? Um, for thirteen. Okay. Thirteen, fourteen. It didn't really work out. So you're in so. California now for the first time. No, actually, no. I was in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, Nevada. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Las yes. Vegas, Nevada. But you're in the states for the first time. Yeah, for or the not first. In the states. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Why exactly. Is yeah. <laughs> totally my <laughs> <The> bad. <laughs> <laughs> you're so. on the mainland. Yeah. For the first well, they treat time. like treat us like we're like you know yeah. a foreign country. See? So. Like um. So yeah. So you're in you're in Las Vegas with your with your yeah. brother, and it's kind of a tense home situation. It's definitely a tense yeah. home situation, and you know, um, people can read the book because it's very hard to like sort of kind of discuss things and stuff, you know. And this has been a, a long time, so it's one of those things. I wrote the book, and we had a discussion, my brother and I, but still, you know, there's things and stuff that has not been resolved. You know, resolved. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was a very dark time in my life, and. You know, I it's it was. I miss my dad. Yes. You know, yeah. I miss I miss his and guidance your mom, I and my mom. Yeah. yeah, but it was one of those things where, you know, um, just lost my dad and my mom. She needed some time and stuff, sort of kind of to mourn. And you know, it was, you know, and it was this. It was this best for me at the young age to go and live with my brother for a little bit. And so, yeah. And and that's um. I thought you explained this really well in the book. It's a cultural thing, right? That yeah. the oldest, mm -hmm. in, in absent of the father, the oldest takes care of yeah, the exactly. family. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, becomes the sort of the father figure so, right. of the family. So, so you're, you're living with him. He's a huge football fan. Things are tense at home. Yeah. And you can play. Yeah. Like you're, you have this well, talent. To tell you the truth, that it was sort of not really established there. And I didn't okay. really, I joined the team, but didn't really, you know. Mm hmm um, so it was one of those things where it didn't start until I, the second time I went to, I came to the mainland, uh, to California, where I started playing football at Don Lugo High School. Okay. And that's sort of where I sort of blossomed because um, I was put in a great environment when I right. came back the second right. time. Yeah. So the first yeah. time I wasn't, like the mm -hmm. first time I was living in fear and getting beaten and all of that. So it was one of those things where trying to, you can't really focus on something if you don't really can you know you can't focus on something when something horrible is happening to you so yeah. um so it was really not a good situation uh in nevada and um and so i mean they can read the book because i don't really want to talk about no, the no, in-depth no, things fine. of it but yeah. it was just it was very difficult and um so um went back we went back he went back to hawaii my mom um Wanted him to come back to sort of run the, the banana farm. Right. And so, um, and things never stopped. And so an aunt of mine came to visit and she saw sort of like the situation that was going on. Mm -hmm. And she asked my mom if she could take me. Yeah. And uh, so I basically, bless I tell, her heart. yeah, basically yeah. I tell people I, when I escaped, I never looked back. Yeah. So I didn't, we didn't even tell anyone that I was going. I just, we just jumped on the plane and I was off to a land mm -hmm. that I never, and it was, it was difficult leaving my mom, but I needed to get away yeah. and I needed to um, sort of, I needed the, the pain to stop. Right. So, so, so in this new place, where was it again? Uh, Chino, California. Chino, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so you're playing football there. Right. Um, are you good at it there? Do you have a Yeah, uniform? you know, I think because I had the support, you know, and people, you know, I could, I mean, I didn't have to look over my shoulder as far as like, you know, you know, and, you know, anything else. But I remember just going there and just loving it at first, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. I was good at it. And I remember a kid challenging me on the football field because I was the biggest kid and I think he felt threatened that I was, right. you know, All that right. I was like, you know, this big kid coming in, but I never sort of kind of played football, you know, so I was just, okay. Yeah. And I just destroyed him on the field. <laughs> so I ended up taking his position and then also Ooh. playing both sides, offense and defense. So, okay. Yeah. But then we became real good friends after that. So, right. but yeah, I remember him calling me out in front of the whole team and, and then, yeah. So that. to 
becoming a beaver. Yes, yes. Oregon State beaver. Um, after playing, yeah, after playing those two years in high school and getting all these awards, uh, you know, um, it was absolutely amazing. And mm -hmm. then being recognized and being a blue chip player around the country, I had the opportunity to go to like Miami to. Um, Michigan, all these other, you know, all these letters that were coming in. Yeah. And to tell you the truth, at first I didn't know what these were, you know, because I, like, right. I mean, I grew up in Hawaii. We didn't yeah. know scholarships, what? Yeah. <laughs> Go to school, what? Um, but they wanted you. But all they these wanted me. Wanted yeah. You. Yeah. They wanted me. But I have to send a reverse because after a while, my um, my English teacher, she's really sort of helped me and oh. throughout everything. But and, what, what uh, was her English teacher's name? Laura. So. Laura. But it was one of those things where um, she used to correct my English because I spoke that pidgin English mm -hmm. coming from Hawaii. And I used to get upset. And then she's like, like, yeah, we talked to your football coaches. And they said, you're doing really well. And you could do this scholarship, but you need to start. And that's when I started focusing on school. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And also, you know, um, growing up in the whole, um, in Hawaii, the special ed. I yeah. was pegged as a special ed kid. From when I was a little kid, oh, first, second grade, yeah. Uh -huh. And then so when I went to California, you have to take the test again. And uh, my counselor was like, you don't belong in any of these classes. So so they challenged me in California and they put me in regular classes and I was able to like graduate, you know, with some, you know, algebra and calculus. It was yeah. amazing. So You were working yeah. below your potential. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, you, it's one of those things where you just sort of kind of pass the kid around. Like, go ahead, go to next. You know, you're a problem here. You're going to be another problem. You know, mm -hmm. they never really believed in you. So uh, so that's why it was it was pretty cool to, to go to California and also, you know, discover that part right. of you. You know, right. and uh, so, yeah, and I got a scholarship and I went to Oregon State University, the Beavers. Uh, yes. I chose them. I had a... You know, I had five visits to different colleges, and it was it was absolutely amazing just to have all of that. You know, yeah. So, yeah. And then, so you're now playing college football. <laughs> yeah. Um, on a team that gets a lot of TV time. Actually, but, no. Didn't they? It <laughs> no. Does sometimes, right? No, no, no. The Beavers. Was like, yeah. Uh, no, we were we were the the doormats of the Pac-10 back then, oh, so we damn. didn't have yeah. <laughs> But that's sort of kind of like why I chose them. Uh, I went to five different visits and it was amazing. But I went, I went to Oregon State because it was like, it was in Corvallis. It was tucked away. There was like 20, 12,000, you know, students. So mm -hmm. it was sort of, I felt like I could sort of kind of hide there and, 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 play, and play football, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, you know, when you do well, there's always recognition always comes your way, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's why I went to Oregon State. I signed there because it was such a beautiful place. And then, so you have, I have this in my notes, and yeah. I don't know if this is college or the pros, but at some point, you have a kiss with your teammate. Was yeah. that in college? Yeah, college. Okay, can you tell me about that? Yeah, um, that was just the weirdest thing. You know, I, I never really did, did anything in uh, in college because I was so scared of someone finding out, you know, and then me becoming sort of like the man on campus, you know, and playing, it was just very difficult. But um, it was a friend of mine, she... I'm not going to tell you what position or what. No, no. <laughs> yeah. He will but, not be Googleable. Yeah, folks. he will not be Google. The Googleizer. Go no, yeah, uh, no Googleizing. Uh, no Googleizing. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I went. I I went to go pick up some notes. Some notes. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, because I missed the class, and then for some reason, um, it just happened. Like, mm -hmm. like it was just, it just happened. Like it just uh, the kiss came, and I was. Sh Felt good, but I was also shocked, and then the fear kicked in that he was going to tell people. Right. And so I pulled back, and I was like, "Dude, like, what are you doing?" You know. So you made it seem like it was him. Him. Yeah. 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 I made it seem like it was him. So, but um, you know, he's married and happily married with kids and stuff like that. But it was it's, it was just that moment in time where yeah, I had a, a an, an amazing kiss by mm -hmm. one of my teammates. So. So, the other thing I was really struck by was how strategic and hyper vigilant you were about guarding the masculine persona that that you had created and and hoped to protect right um that you were very conscious it seemed and yeah. you can correct me if i'm yeah. wrong um but it seemed like you were very conscious all the time of making sure that you didn't show any inkling of being gay yes and you also the other side of that was you lived in a really intense fear of being found out. 
Right. And that, that lasted, I, I'm, I'm talking more, I mean, it definitely came up in college right. in the book, but I'm more in the prose. Specifically, I think when you were a Viking is when I read right. most of it. Can you talk about that? I, um, yeah, definitely. It was, oh, gosh. I, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult, right? Um, because it's, it was one of those things where when, when you start doing well and you come from a place like a poor family, and so knowing that you could lose during that time, you could lose everything by someone starting a rumor about you or start t or outing you, right? So all that hard work and sacrifice that you did just to get to that point could be taken away by someone doing that. That was the big fear of all of it, you know, not being able to afford college and having a scholarship full ride and knowing during that time, if somebody found out and outed you that you could be taken away, that scholarship could be taken away, right? You could be alienized by so many of your teammates and stuff like that. So yes, I think um, when you grow up with nothing, you tend to, to, you know, to protect what you have, right? And you don't want that to go away. So uh, for me, all the negative things that happened in my life growing up, I use all that for fuel of, you know, fuel for the fire to like, you know, to get me where I was, you know, getting the scholarship to Oregon State. So, yes, I it was hard, you know, waking up every single morning and walking into that locker room and transforming yourself into somebody who wasn't like straight guy. Right. That's probably the hardest thing. It wasn't about being beat up or about being, you know, all this, because I'm a big dude. I can take care of myself. It was about things like that that could be taken away from you by in the in the in a second just by somebody doing something like that. So yes, I got up every single morning, I looked over my shoulder, I protected who I was, right? As I played college, the more I would play, the more I would recognition I would get, the more nationally recognizable I would get. And so it was one of those things where you never can trust anyone. And so what you do, you create this whole world of your own and you protect, right? So that's why I protected myself, looking over my shoulder, right? Making sure I said the right thing, making sure I went home with the woman, making sure that people saw me go to the strip clubs, making sure that, you know, I went to church, making sure like, you know, all hiding all of those things is exhausting. But you know what? I don't know. That's yeah. a... um, thank you for that, because that is a really good peek inside the work it took for you and i you know i know that you're describing in a way another time yeah but yeah. not entirely another yeah. time and i'm not just talking about a hyper masculine sport like football i'm talking yeah. about anything no definitely um, yeah definitely where where people are afraid to be authentic and um yeah. so for you to just give that and look into how much work it is <laughs> to be this beautiful person that you are, you know, like this big kid, the easy smile, the, the, the humor. And I know that you had to disguise a lot of that in order to present. Yeah, right? you definitely had to do that. And then, but you know what, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. after a while, just like everything else, it just becomes part of your life. Right. You don't realize the stuff that it's so negative and so the things that you do to sacrifice everything until you come out and then you look back and then you're like, Holy shit, that was, I had yeah. to do all of that just yeah. to get this. Like, you know, it's like, you know, it's funny, you know, but, you know, that's part of the LGBTQ community. That's how, you know, a lot of, you know, my brothers and my sisters have to go through, right? People always realize this stuff. Oh, what is the big deal? Well, the big deal is the big deal. You go throughout your whole life with your family and your friends since your childhood to your, you know, your grown up, right? And just the fear of knowing that when you tell them the truth, what everybody said you should tell the truth that you could lose them. Mm -hmm. That's the fear. Yeah. So that's the big deal. Because back in those days when I was growing up, no one, it, being gay was not very popular. It was always the negative thing, right? You would die of AIDS. You would do this. You know, you're, you're weak. You're, you know, you're a sissy. You're a girl. Like, mm -hmm. so, I mean, there was no positive images like they do now, you know? They have great positive images on television and on the radio and role models, people coming out, it was, it's never had that back in my days, yeah. you know? Um, I have a couple of quotes from yeah. your book yeah. about that. Um, one is football is a man's sport. Mm -hmm. Merriman brag about the girl they just plowed. 
I couldn't believe the way these guys talked about women. Homophobia peppered the banter. I laughed at the gay jokes to be a part of the conversation. Yeah. I hid my laughter. Inside, I cried. Right. Right. And then um, the other one is, uh, it's a former teammate of yours that said, if the guys found out that another player was gay on a Monday, he wouldn't be able to play on Sunday. Right. My teammates would take me out and practice. A gay player would be punished, outcast for life. I mean, like a couple of years ago, there was like the whole bounty thing from the NFL with, you know, with the New Orleans Saints, you know, taking out quarterbacks. How much you think it would be for the gay guy? Yeah, I didn't you know? know about that bounty thing. Yeah, yeah, it's the whole bounty thing that teams like uh, they would offer like money to players to take out a quarterback or to take out Damn. somebody. Yeah, it's crazy. So, I mean, how much you think it would be for a gay guy? Right, right. You know? It would happen. Uh, and also, yeah. I've dominated so many offensive linemen and people in the NFL. I mean, how many times you think that they would like, you know, with their teammates teasing and that you got you got beat up by a fag, mm. by, a, by a gay guy? I mean, you know, it's like. Yeah, it's you know, it would be unacceptable. Unacceptable. Yeah. Right. Unacceptable. But I've done it so many times, you know, so. Yeah. came out on real sports yay yes <laughs> can you tell me about that like what led up to it what it was like uh, to come out on national television so yeah my partner at the time um we had we adopted two kids and so we were um we were living with our two beautiful children and um they're twins a, twins a boy yes. and a girl mm -hmm. uh and so um a friend of mine who was a, a videographer was like dude we could do a documentary on this of like what do you mean like documentary of this and yeah. of, you know but be anonymous and I'm like no way like right, you know it's right. like I have two beautiful kids and stuff like I don't like to like put them out there and stuff so he went and got tried to get I said okay I talked to my partner at the time and he went to go try to get funding and so HBO said I mean yeah we definitely we won't fund the thing but we have this show called real sports Mm -hmm. And so I talked with my partner at the time and then we were having a difficult time raising our kids, you know, in the closet. So I was the dad because they looked like me and he was sort of like the uncle or whatever. Right. We got so tired of lying to people, even going to pick out schools for them. You know, we had to sort of kind of lie, you know. And so we talked to each other like, let's do it. You know, let's come out and let's, you know, and we didn't think it's going to be a big deal. We didn't. We thought, OK. We're going to have the American dream, you know, the house, the white picket fence, the two dogs, the two kids, minus the wife. You know, it's like, but when we came out, it blew up and um, it was very scary at the time. And I remember doing the interview. And, Is it uh, Brian Gumbel? Yeah, with Brian Gumbel. Mm -hmm. But Bernie, uh, somebody else did it. Oh, gosh, I'm having a mind block. But um, he asked me that question on the camera. Are you, um, you know, what the secret was and I couldn't tell him. Because I, I, it was an excruciating pain that came through me. And I just couldn't do it. So something that should have just took, you know, a couple hours to film or three, you know, you, it took all day. And it was, I just couldn't. I puked and I had to. But then when I said it for the first time, I came back, you know, from the bathroom, said it for the first time, it felt so amazing just to have that release. Because I think the fear of the unknown, I think that's a lot, you know, for the LGBTQ community and people that are coming out, it's just the fear of the unknown. Like it, we talked about earlier, who is going to support us? Who's going? Who we're going to lose? Who? God, remember? If, imagine if straight people had to do that, had to go through that. Oh, I have to come out as straight. Oh my gosh, I might have to lose my family and friends. Yeah. You know. So anyway, it's like so. Anyway, that we came up on resports and uh, it was it was great. It was a great opportunity and it's a great feeling. I tell people a whole you know this whole burden just fell off my shoulder and you know i felt light as a feather but i, I stepped on the scale I was still 315 pounds so <laughs> it was, <laughs> but it was an amazing feeling yeah. you know uh just to sort of walk out the next day and feel free mm. how many people besides the men that you've been with mm -hmm. had you told i'm gay to how many people at that point um you know we had our little 
pocket of like a little circle yeah of friends. circle of friends mm-hmm. and family his family so we you, you know, told your mom yeah i told i told my mom yeah. so my mom and my sisters um no just my mom and then um and then he his family all his family knew and so it was sort of kind of small circle of friends and so but it was it was great you know i lost a lot of friends and family from it um but slowly they are coming back mm. you know 10 years later it's like no skin off my back you're the yeah. one who missed 10 years of our friendship wow you know so i'm i've been living my life and i've been happy and i've been and they see it on instagram and they see it on you know facebook of what we're doing and you know they apologize but still it was, it was yes i lost a lot of friends and family they're coming back but um it was this great feeling amazing feeling to have to be able to walk down the street mm-hmm. with my family my kids and everybody know that we were a family it was one of those things where all my friends that played in the NFL took for granted. That's what I wanted, and I got it. And it right. was an amazing feeling. Yeah, so. you, and you talk about that, going to your teammates' homes, yep. backyard barbecues. Yeah, exactly. And, getting to, and being invited into their family homes. Yeah, exactly. But not being... Mm-hmm. Um, you are the answer to a trivia question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which is... Two of them. Yeah. Oh, two, okay, so yeah. wait. I'm just going to do one I of just, them right yeah. now. Who is, the NF, who is the first NFL player to sing a national anthem and then start in an NFL game? Yeah, yeah. And I found out from a friend, they were playing Trivia Pursuit at okay. the cabin. Uh-huh. And they're like, they call me and they're like, dude, you... you yeah, I know that answer. The guy was like, wait, I know that answer. Yeah, so... Yeah. So... so yeah. You- this talent for football yeah um and it's it's absolutely saved you in so many ways right yeah. yes and and brought you to these places that you you probably wouldn't have gone on yeah. your own. <laughs> exactly but now you also have this passion and complete talent this beautiful voice oh, that you got you. to showcase <laughs> um in that way on that day yeah yeah. And then, which brings you into my life, because yeah. then in 20, is, is it 2016? Yeah, 2017, I, I believe, yeah. On The Voice? Yeah, on The Voice. Um, so can you talk about your singing and your singing career and how you kind of uh, juxtapose that with your football career and what what means more to you or can you, do you have to choose? Well, I, you have to, I have to sort of like thank my mom and my dad. So when I was a little kid, they used to force me <laughs> to sing in front of all like the guests and my dad taught me a song called god bless my daddy and so i used to have to sing that to everyone and even though i was crying at the time <laughs> i had to still do it but mm-hmm. you know fast forward to college and singing in the locker room and doing a lot of luther vandross and a lot of uh mm. you know um, i'm gonna make you do yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of that. Um, it was funny because uh, one of our trainers, who was a uh, basketball trainer, he goes, "You should sing the national anthem for um, for the basketball game." You know, I was like, I thought he was joking. He's like, "Okay, if you can get me it." And so the next day he comes, you're on for tomorrow. I'm like, "What?" And wow. yeah, and I had to learn that. And like, you know, I knew it, but it wasn't like that. So I remember them announcing my name. And people were talking, you know how people talk. And then when they announced my name, it was like you could hear a pin drop. Mm. And I think my leg started shaking <laughs> <laughs> until I blurted out that first note. Mm. And then it was smooth sailing. Yeah. And then from then on, uh, you know, got to sing for a bunch of NBA games and stuff like that. And then when I got drafted to the Green Bay Packers, it was a Thursday night C- TNT game, mm-hmm. a national televised. And they wanted, um, they asked me if I wanted to sing. So, wow. and I said, yeah, but I wasn't nervous about singing the national anthem. I was in front of what, a hundred thousand people. I was nervous because my idol, Mike Singletary was playing for the bears and we were playing the bears and I, like he was staring right at me when I was singing. Oh so goodness. yeah, I was like, <laughs> ah. I used to try to play like him when I was a little kid. So how cool. Uh, yeah, that was super cool. And then, so he came and gave me a big hug and I was like this, wow, you know, and then I started in the game, but I think that's when. You know, I just knew and stuff that, you know, I guess people love my voice. Yes. And then, uh, you know, and I think growing up and listening to a bunch of Motown 
and trying to sing like a big black woman. It was always <laughs> like, it always helped me because I have this high voice, you know, I have yeah. a very high voice. And so I'm a high tenor. But yeah, and that's where the passion came in. And, you know, just been singing all my life and, and, and doing, you know, a bunch of galas. And actually, and tonight I'm doing a gala yes. uh, to, yeah. for, with Tammy Brown. It's 20 years of Tammy. Uh, she's also, you know, donating some of the proceeds to my um, my organization. Hate is wrong, right. but I'm performing there tonight. But um, yeah, and just it's been a it's been a great opportunity. And I got a call from, um, not a call, an email from someone from The Voice, and I thought it was a joke. And then somebody called me. Oh, they solicited like, you. Yeah, That's somebody. So great. Yeah, yeah, somebody called me, and they're like, and I thought it was a joke. I thought a friend of mine was joking. I was like, oh, okay, send me the information. So they wanted, they offered me a private audition in Chicago. And so I went to Chicago and before you know it, I was there at the blind auditions, uh, singing and, and yeah. What did, what did you sing? I saw, I sang Rise Up, the Andre oh, Day. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> you got to get up there for that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I sang Rise Up and mm -hmm. it was pretty cool. It was fun to sing. I had, I did it my own little way and stuff, so. It's amazing. But, yeah, but music has always been a part of my life. I think music is a very, you know, it, it, this ice breaker for a lot of things in people's lives, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and I love making people happy. That's why I love cooking as well, you know, to make people happy, yes. putting a smile on their That's pretty cool. I, w I want to talk about your cooking, but yeah. first I want to, is it is Tammy Brown. Yes. I have to thank her because she brought you out here. <laughs> yes. Which allowed us to get you. Exactly, um, yeah. Because you don't live in Los Angeles where we right. record, and so this is a special treat. So yeah. thank you, Tammy Brown. Tammy, I love her. Um, tell me about your work as an advocate. Tell me about your organization. Oh, I have an organization called Hate is Wrong. And um, so I have to reverse. I, You know, because I was living in the closet and because I couldn't say anything when I was, you know, uh, playing football in the NFL, I created this saying, hate in any form is wrong. So I, it was an umbrella for me. So every time I heard something that was sexism, racism, or homophobic, I could say, hey, dude, hate in any form is wrong without outing myself or anything, right? Um, mm. So it, it sort of kind of stuck with me and um, until I came, when I came out, it's still, you know, I, I would use that going around the country speaking about homophobia and, and diversity and tolerance and acceptance and inclusion. Um, I would use that, hating any form is wrong. And so when the Super Bowl was in um, uh, Minneapolis three years ago, um, I turned that hating any form is wrong into a nonprofit. Hate is wrong. And so what we do, and the reason why I did that, because I wanted to make sure that the LGBTQ community had a presence at the Super Bowl, right? It was my wow. way, it was my way of, you know, um, sort of bridging the gap between the profession I was in and the people that I love. And not only that, um, like I said, to have a presence at the Super Bowl and, so we do an inclusion party at the Super Bowl. That's uh, major. Yeah, this is our, our third annual. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be in Miami. And so uh, it, we're sponsored by Adidas. Adidas is a big, huge sponsor. Tito's is a sponsor as well. Um, you know, the Minnesota Vikings has also sponsored it. Also, the NFL has sponsored the, 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 the party. And 100% of the, the ticket sales uh, from the party goes to anti-bullying programs within the state where the Super Bowl is. Oh. So last, uh, we donated money in Minneapolis. We donated money in Atlanta. So the money raised next year in Miami will stay in the Miami. So we're just a nonprofit that raises money to give money. None of our board members get paid. We just love what we do. It's a volunteer basis. And like, again, it's a part, it's a way that, you know, the LGBTQ Q community can have a presence at the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And it's growing every single year. Uh, 98 Degrees is, um, I'm thinking about coming and performing and That's being great. our headliner for this year. Will um, you sing with them? I will. Yeah, yes. I do. I perform and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, and then we have a bunch of, I bring DJs and it's just a big fun party. And it's fun because we have NFL players straight and gay and everybody just meshes and have a fantastic time. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and you know, and it's, it's a great opportunity for people to sort of kind of, if you haven't been in sort of that environment, to come and to see like how amazing it is. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's what I do. I go around the country and I speak on homophobia and sports. My, uh, my, my agents, uh, Greater Talent Network out of New York City. Yes. And uh, it's, they, they book me around the country. They're amazing. 
uh, there, you know, and it's, it's great just to sort of kind of get the word out and educate people mm-hmm. uh, and just show the aloha, you know? Yeah. So that's the thing. I think it, I break down so many stereotypes when I go to you know, colleges because they're expecting this different person to come up. Yeah. And then they see this other person, like this big football player, you know, and, you know, it's crazy because all the athletes in the, the room, they're, they're wanting to be where I was. So the respect's there. Right. Mm, that's They're, so important. Yeah, very important. And I remember speaking at a university to the athletic department and at the beginning people making jokes and you know all of that and by at the end of it I demanded their respect and they showed me their respect. They see people were crying and stuff like that cuz you know it's one of those things where dude, you know, I think the fear with everybody comes out first and yes. so they sort of settled. Yeah. And, um, I was able to speak at the the combines for the uh, for the NFL uh, a couple years back. And it was funny because out of 300 top athletes, there was one stupid question. Which was? Um, so if you're a fag and I call you a fag, is that offending? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you it was, but it took all my energy not to go over that table. And <laughs> no, I'm kidding. People don't um, know you can't use that word. You know, back in, that was like 10, that was about 10 years ago. I don't ago. care. I know. So he thought it was a joke. He thought he was going to get laughs from all his colleagues. He thought, you know, but you know what? The reason why I held my tongue is because I saw around the room and everybody was like, you idiot. Yeah. Like you could tell. Like, they were with you. you kidding yeah. me. Like, are you, this is, got, you're trying to get where he's at. Like yeah. and you're acting as if like, you know, so, um, and then after a lot of athletes, dude, he doesn't represent all of us. So I hope you understand that. Thanks for, you know, so it was great to have that experience. So it was a good know. experience. Very good. And, yeah. I, you know, I said, you know what, anytime you use the word faggot, queer, homo, or gay, and you need, use it in a negative term, and this, I just told him straight out, it's like calling a woman a bitch mm-hmm. or calling African-American a nigga. Mm-hmm. It's not right. No. And so it was like, when I said those words, they're like, uh because yeah. it's true, right? I'm not going to sugarcoat anything out there, right? Because I think we do that a lot. We sugarcoat things and stuff, but you have to just go direct, right? So, and, you know, in actuality, a couple of years ago, he sent me a message on Facebook apologizing. So Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, but, you know, and that's the thing. You can, you know, you don't, sometimes you change people at that time, but because of the experience you had with them, later on in their lives and stuff, they figure it out. Right. Or they're, right? they weren't ready then. They weren't and ready. They become then. Ready, but you can still but be then the you messenger. don't know their environment. You don't know the the family that they yeah. grew up in. You don't right. know the you know they might have been religion or might have been homophobic mm-hmm. or might have been. So it's one of those things where sometimes when you're young, that young, you have to just give them some time. Like even yeah. when I tell these kids when when they come out to their parents and I you know I coach them, I said a lot of the damage is done in that ten to twenty minutes. Because it's one of those things, sometimes you, they, you you know, you don't get the answer you want. So it's like, you don't, you know, want me, F you, all of this. Right, so they go you know, off. You're, they yeah. go off. I said, just walk, even if your parents don't accept it, say, you know what, I love you. When you're ready to talk, I'll be here. And walk away. Yeah. Because that's right there. And then you don't talk to him because all this stuff was just said, you know, you all these hateful things. But walk away because then eventually, I'm a parent. And if my kids did that, I would miss them. But I would never do that to my kids, but yeah. I would miss them. Like, I would, that's my blood. That's my yeah. child, right? So, yeah. but sometimes when you put that negative thing and that hate in there, then that's why it takes a little bit longer for them to sort of kind of figure it out. Sure. Yeah, so. So you're, you're going around the country and mm-hmm. you're speaking, you're being this advocate. And at the same time, you're dividing your time between minnesota and provincetown yes right? yes provincetown yes. massachusetts provincetown massachusetts it's <laughs> what an amazing place and you're so. at the pilgrim house i am i'm at yes. the pilgrim house i'm doing a show and then i'm also the executive chef there at the, the pilgrim house so. and, and and yes so, so yeah this is the, the whole now the yes. cooking thing comes <laughs> yes. in right so i have been catering for the last uh probably 20 years and I donate um, chef dinners to big galas to fundraise and stuff. And, you know, my dinners go for probably like 10 grand to 15. So I go to people's homes and I cook for them. And I got that culinary skill from my mother. Mm-hmm. So being the youngest in eight, you know, of eight kids and I was in the kitchen when I was five years old learning how to cook. And my So all my recipes are my mom's recipes. I doctor them up a little bit. Uh, you know, I Americanize them, I could say. 
because you know it's the traditional uh, Polynesian. So is it, yeah, it's like yeah. Samoan, Samoan, and Hawaiian, and, 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 Hawaiian and all of that. Beautiful. Yeah. So and I've done. Uh, like I want spam sushi. Yeah, spam sushi. Hey. People like shun on that, but then when I make <laughs> no, it, they're I want like, some right now. <laughs> they're like, it's funny because I make it, and they're like spam, and then they taste it. It's like. Spam. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I won the Taste of the Minnesota Vikings. It's a big food festival. Uh, I do the Taste of the NFL. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're an amazing organization. It's the number one hottest party in at the Super Bowl called the Taste of the NFL. Okay. And last year I was represented by Verlasso Salmon. It's a sustainable salmon, and they sponsored me, and I was able to cook for like 4,000 people. It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was amazing. a slender yuppie type guy stopped in his tracks and said this is a private community and then he proceeds to tell me that I'm not welcome and I must leave immediately or else he will have me arrested when I shared this story with a white female acquaintance the next day she told me that maybe I should be careful of the clothing and sunglasses that I wear the thing that made me feel mad was not the asshole neighbor <laughs> <laughs> but the woman, who I don't think is racist, but didn't see anything wrong with the neighbor's actions and thought the problem was the way that I dress. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's, uh, but that's what's happening around the country now, mm -hmm. right? That so whole... he was profiled. Yeah, right? definitely profiled. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. But yeah, the friend, it's, I, I don't... A friend. I think well, it's just... He calls her an acquaintance. Oh, I think acquaintance. That's probably the... okay. Actually, okay. he does call her a friend first, and then he uh. says acquaintance. I think yeah. that she is definitely more of an acquaintance. Yeah, I think and not you know, a friend. What, what, ah, wow, well, I don't. I can't see any of my friends doing that. No. Um, but yeah, I think I, I would definitely be taken aback from someone. You know, if, if they ever said that to me, and this this was like, wait a minute, you know me. Yeah. You know my, you know my family, and and for you to think that it was something I did something wrong, wow, that's yeah. pretty, that's pretty crazy. But yeah, I think he was definitely profiled. And you do you know. have experience with that? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you I know, know you do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, of course, it had some, you know, stuff like that. Especially when I played in the NFL and driving my fancy car and getting pulled over by the cops, you know, because I had a convertible. You know, BMW and always asking like, oh, so, you know, whose car is this? And, right. you know, stuff right. like that. I mean, it happened a lot in yeah. Minnesota and I, I'm sure it happens a lot everywhere else and stuff. So, you know, so um, so that that definitely is real. And I, I definitely experienced many of that um, at times and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, it's 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 great to sort of kind of like um, like throw it back into their faces sometimes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then you see the reaction of like, oh, oh, Mr. Tuolo, oh, I'm now I'm Mr. Tuolo, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, yeah, Instead now, of, now, now that right. you know who yeah, I now am, now that you know who I am and stuff, you know, so right. I, you know, for me, I don't think you know people should judge anyone by the, the their looks or anything like that, um, but it's it's like it's like it's the world that we live in. Right. Yeah. It's definitely the world that we live in and how to eliminate that is sort of by just, I think, talking about it and making sure people realize and understand and stuff that we all come from different walks of life. And that's why inclusion mm -hmm. <laughs> is very important. And that's why in the NFL, that's why that's why I'm doing that. I want to make sure that, you know, the people, the, the sports fan understand who we are as a community with the LGBTQ community. Right. So. I told you I was going to get back to you about some Luther. Oh, so, um, gosh. Can okay. you please? Okay. We'll try something. Everybody turn this down is... your, your levels on yeah. your headphones. <laughs> I'll back up a little bit. So okay. this is the one of the songs that I did for, uh, it wasn't, Luther sang it, but it was also, um, it was by the Carpenters. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to sing this acapulco. <laughs> they won't sound the same, but it's like, no. So. Long ago, and also far away, I fell in love with you before the second show, and your guitar 
And you sound so sweet and clear, but you're not really here. It's just the radio. And don't you remember you told me you loved me, baby? You said you'd be coming back this way again. And baby, 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 oh.